version 4 of the Kerala treatment guidelines pertaining to COVID-19 was released. The major changes in the guidelines is that it has totally become evidence-based and the focus is on therapeutic stewardship, that is using the, the right drug and the right dose, the right time for the right duration for the right patient. As in the previous uh, guideline, we have divided the patients into mild, moderate, severe as well as critical. And based on the categorization or category A patients, they do not require any drug, they do not require antibiotics like astromycin, they do not require any vitamins because multiple studies have shown that these drugs are not going to prevent the progression of COVID-19 to moderate or severe disease. So what they require, the patients with mild severity require is isolation as well as constant monitoring. They should be monitored every 24 to 48 hours. Red flag signs should be assessed and if they are present, they should be uh, referred to the higher centers for treatment. That is, we should assess the progression to category B or moderate to severe disease. So when it comes to the category B, that is the patients with high risk factors and those who are symptomatic, if they are having fever and cough for five days, they can be started on medicinide, MDI, 800 micrograms, two cups, BD for five to seven days. If they progress to moderate to severe disease, then they definitely the guidelines pertaining to the treatment of moderate to severe disease will apply. The one major change in this uh, the guideline is that the high, those with higher risk factors have again been divided into those with the highest risk factors so that we can identify them before hypoxia sets in and we can administer this monoclonal antibody cocktail that is map and map in a timely fashion. So what this monoclonal antibody cocktail does is that it is IgG1 and can bind to two separate epitopes in the, the spike protein receptor binding domain on, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus and thereby it can bring down or it can prevent the attachment to AC2 receptor and it can bring down the viral load and dramatically. So it has to be given in a preemptive fashion, that is before hypoxia develops, or it should be given maximum before within 10 days of symptom onset. Once hypoxia develops, monoclonal antibody cocktail should not be administered. Since it's a costly medicine, handpicking of patients who are likely to benefit from this monoclonal antibody cocktail is of paramount importance. That is why we insist on highest risk factors. For example, patients with a body mass index more than 35, patients above 65 years of age, those on immunosuppressive therapies, so those with, say, uh, cardiovascular disease, cerebrovascular disease, those on chemotherapy. In the case of diabetes, diabetes or hypertension per se is not an indication for monoclonal antibody cocktail. This is an uncontrolled diabetes. We are arbitrarily put the cut, uh, cut off at say HbA1c more than 10 or diabetes with end organ damage. So the basic idea is that we need to identify in category B itself, we need to identify those patients with highest risk of progression to the severe disease and patients who are likely to die if they progress to moderate to severe disease. They should be identified at the earliest and they should be given monoclonal antibody cocktail. Now, the favipravir, ivermectin, etc., which were present in the previous guidelines, have been take, totally taken out of this guideline because despite, say, one and a half years, we don't have enough evidence to support the continuation of use of this, these drugs. So, when we come to those with hypoxia, this moderate severity as well as severe disease, the mainstay happens to me, the antiviral drug, they are undisturbed. We don't have enough evidence to, uh, uh, to uh, we have evidence to give remdesivir only as an emergency use authorization should be given to patients with hypoxia within 10 days of disease onset. Having said that, those drugs with mortality benefit in COVID-19 in who are hypoxic happens to be steroids at the right dose at the right time. Steroids should be administered in a timely fashion. Early administration of steroids as well as too late administration of steroids are going to be detrimental. So when we speak of immunomodulators, our backbone is definitely steroids at the right dose. If the patient is not improving, despite say 24 hours of steroids, if the oxygen requirements are going up, and if there is evidence of say cytokine storm like a highly elevated CRP more than 75 milligram per liter or say an elevated IL-6, then the patients might benefit from administration of IL-6 receptor antagonist that is tocilizumab. Now, in addition to this guideline is that along with this thing, another immunomodulator that is the JAK1 inhibitor, says Janus kinase inhibitors, baricitinib as well as tofacitinib has been as uh, is, is a part of this guideline. Who is going to benefit from this, uh, this thing, JAK inhibitors? are those patients who despite uh, use of steroids, say you start the patient on hypoxic patients on steroids and you wait for say 24 hours or so, and the patient is on say eight liters per minute of oxygen, FAO2 more than 0.54, and if the patient is not improving despite steroids, they can be started on say baricitinib or tofacitinib. These are oral medications. 
which have to be given for 7 to 14 days. And uh, this JAK1 means that it is through the JAK1 that the IL-6 is going to act. And then the second indication is that there may be certain patients who may not tolerate steroids. So suppose the patient is having, say, upper GI bleed, or the patient is having, say, an altered sensorium, which could be worsened by steroids, or the patient is having, say, uncontrolled diabetes, and, the, you know, you are not able to control the blood sugar levels with steroids. In such situations, you know, baricitinib can be used uh, instead of steroids. So what, what usually is being done is that uh, this baricitinib should be used as an adjunct to steroids to control this inflammation. And tocilizumab, the, the recommendation for uh, tocilizumab uh, remains the same. The one difference is with uh, regard to another crucial intervention, that is anticoagulation. The previous guidelines, we said that you know, all the trials did show the evidence for prophylactic dose anticoagulation in moderate, severe, as well as critically ill individuals with COVID-19. We were not mentioning about therapeutic dose anticoagulation. And the rapid dose anticoagulation was reserved for those patients with proven or suspected pulmonary embolism or DVD. But as, as the current evidence goes, in uh, those with uh, moderate to severe disease, it is better to use therapeutic dose anticoagulation over prophylactic dose anticoagulation. In those who are critically ill, decision can be taken by the, the physician whether you need to use prophylactic dose anticoagulation or therapeutic dose anticoagulation by weighing the risk of bleeding versus the risk of thrombosis. Another important addition is, as we have said, that the aim of this guideline is to bring down the mortality in the higher risk groups. So pregnancy, we know that the second wave in the mortality among the pregnant ladies was higher compared to the mortality in the same uh, risk category during the first wave. So in pregnancy also, uh, this time around, we have devoted a separate chapter to how to deal with, how to treat pregnant ladies with COVID-19. And there is a session on critical care guidelines pertaining to the management of uh, pregnant ladies with COVID-19. The pediatric uh, the guidelines uh, have been modified a bit, as well as the pedi pediatric critical care guidelines. The MISC guidelines have been modified a bit. And we have included a session on multisystem inflammatory syndrome uh, treatment adults. And uh, uh, and diabetes, uh, you know, we know that one of the most important factors which really determine the outcome of uh, patients with COVID-19 is their glycemic status and how... Uh, efficiently we are able to maintain euglycemia. It becomes difficult, especially in those with moderate disease, when we need to use steroids. So our aim must be to achieve euglycemia at any cost. So that is why, you know, if we are not able to achieve that, we should switch over to alternate immunomodulation along with steroids. You keep a minimal dose of steroids and then try to have baricitinib. All the, the contraindications of this uh, immunomodulated drugs, etc., are, are, are given clearly in the guidelines. So in short, the aim of the, the revision of these guidelines is actually to individualize the treatment of COVID-19 so as to uh, ensure minimal mortality due to COVID-19 in the state by targeting the patients at high risk of progression to the severe or critical COVID-19. Thank you.